Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Could you be biased and not know it? Let's hear from Howard Ross, author of Everyday Bias. Howard, thanks for being with us today. Hey, Bill, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Howard, as I said to you before the show, this has always been a topic I've been very interested in. So can we begin by asking you to to define the word bias? Sure, of course. I mean, let let me explain it this way. But bias is essentially is a decision-making mechanism of our mind. And, And if you think about it, you know, we travel through life, we see all kinds of circumstances every day. And, um, and we make very quick decisions, something as simple as walking across the floor. You know, we make assumptions that the floor will hold our weight. Um, and so, you know, we have a tendency to just base that assumption on the fact that we've walked across so many floors in our life that have held our weight. Now, if we, if we stepped on something and there was a trap door and we fell through, our next time walking across floors would be much different. We would be, that we would be a little bit more gingerly about how we approach it. Or, or if anybody's been burned at, on a stove before, they know what I mean. The next, two weeks, three weeks, month, maybe even longer, you're very careful about how you approach the stove. And so, so the mind does this because we, we learn what to expect in life based on our past experiences. Now, in a lot of cases, like not touching a hot stove, that could be really valuable because it protects us. Um, if we see danger in front of us in some way, if we see somebody glaring at us with their fists clenched and walking towards us, our brain makes an accurate and, and smart assumption. This person may want to harm us. At least put yourself in alert mode, if not run, right? The problem is, of course, that these assumptions are, can sometimes be based on information that's not accurate. So if you have a stereotype about somebody, it, as in the case of example, for example, with these cases where we see like the George Floyd case or they, you know, these dozens and dozens of cases of African-Americans who've been shot by police officers. If you've got stereotypes to say African-Americans are more dangerous, African-Americans are more are stronger, more almost indestructible, then that might lead to a police officer pulling a trigger at the wrong time. Or if we have stereotypes that people are not as smart or as competent, that might lead to a hiring decision to be made in the wrong way. So, so, so the function itself is neither good nor bad, but it can lead to some disastrous results if we're not aware of it. Now, I guess most of us, if you said the word bias, we would all think right away we would put it in a negative column. But from what I'm hearing, bias can be good or bad. Yeah, absolutely. There's sometimes when bias can be life-saving. Um, you know, the function of the brain to make these automatic decisions can, can be incredibly helpful to us if, we, if it keeps us from you know, putting ourselves in danger or if it prevents us from real you know, real challenges that are coming our way and it makes us more alert and aware of those earlier, they could be actually very beneficial and even life-saving to us. It's like I said before, it's not the function itself, it's how it gets applied that's the issue. Now, most of us, I think, would admit we might be biased to the local sports team, whatever that is. I'm in New York, the team is the Met, Mets or Yankees, I'm a Mets fan. And I admit that and I know that. Can we also be unconsciously biased? Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I've said for years, Bill, that uh, we will probably resolve um, race and gender before we resolve Michigan, Ohio State or Yankees, Red Sox. So, you know, um, but but all kidding aside, not only can we be biased without realizing it, but overwhelmingly most of our biases are unconscious to us. We can't possibly keep track of them all because this learning process that we've had in life goes on. And and, and this is why even, you know, I, I tell it. We share examples myself all the time about how even with all the years I've worked on these issues I've been doing, I went to my first civil rights meeting 54 years ago or something like that. I worked on this issue on myself for my entire life. And I still have times when, when something will like pop into my head, like a thought will pop into my head or an impression of somebody or a reaction to somebody. And sometimes I will, I'll catch it and sometimes I won't, but sometimes it's like, where did that come from? You know, it's like, it's still, it's still buried in our psyche. And so, you know, all of the programming we've got from our media, from schools, from our parents, the family background we grew up in, sometimes our religious institutions create what Brian Stevenson had called, has called this narrative of racial difference in our culture that particularly shows up. And of course it's true around gender and sexual orientation as well and other you know, distinctions. Yeah. We kidded about it before the show, but you started your book off with uh, two little anecdotes or or one anecdote about uh, wines in a supermarket. Could you tell our audience that anecdote and how that applies to bias? Sure. Some re- some researchers in the UK um, did this study where um, they they went into grocery stores and uh, for a few days 
uh, in the wine section, they removed all the wines that weren't German or French, and they had only German or French wines. And then on alternative days, they had a German flag up and played German music, or a French flag up and played French music. And that was the only difference. And then they watched people's buying patterns. And, and overwhelmingly, 70% or something like that of the people bought the wine that was being influenced that day. And the interesting thing is that almost nobody um, said that they even heard the music. And, um, and only one person in the entire study said that the music had, had influenced them. The rest, I guess, was just coincidence. But, you know, but just having that music playing, these subliminal influences have a huge impact on us. And it's important for us to realize that, for example, when we watch TV, we watch the news, we see things that are depicted. Um, this is one of the reasons why things like, you know, the, the representations we see, whether they're, you know, names that people use, language that we use, statues that are there, all have an influence on this subliminal um, these subliminal biases that we pick up. And I thought that was such a great point. And for, for anyone listening in the business that they're in, I'm thinking, it's funny, this morning taking a long walk. If I was a dentist, is there certain music in the, we could play in the background that would relax people or make them more um, fear, fear less that of the dentist or whatever procedure might be coming up or maybe a store that... Uh, presents a certain type of music when people are walking through it that would incentivize us to buy something or spend more than we normally would. Let's well, you know, that it, way. it's interesting you say that, Bill, because, you know, it, it, first of all, the answer is undoubtedly yes, that there is certain music that generates certain emotions and certain music that generates others. But there are other ways that this kind of thinking can be activated. So, for example, we know that when people are subjected to very loud noises, loud music, flashing lights and all this kind of stuff, they tend to make more impulsive, fast brain decisions and less more thoughtful decisions. So what do you think Las Vegas has in all the places where they have gambling machines? They don't have quiet pastoral music because that would lead people to be you know, more thoughtful about the decisions they're making. They want people to be reactive. And so they got music blaring and lights flashing and, you know, women walking around scantily clothed and all of this stuff, which is all designed to create a distractive environment. Um, which has people be more impulsive and therefore, you know, throw the money on the table or pull that slot machine handle. That's why I'm not winning. It's not really my fault. It's, it's the casino's fault for making me rush my decision to pick the that, wrong number. Thank right. you, put, Howard. Put, you make put me the, feel a lot put better. Those, put those soundproof earphones on when you go in there, Bill. That's exactly <laughs> it. What are the typical areas of bias that most of us might think of when we hear that word or when people talk to you about it? Um, uh, do you mean identity, which identities, or do you mean what kinds of bias? Uh, kinds of bias. Oh, I see. Okay, good. Well, there are a number that we see um, fairly regularly. I mean, one is attribution bias, and that is that you know we tend to attribute a certain kinds of uh, a behavior or a certain kind of quality to a particular person or circumstance based on what we've heard about those people, and that's a place where stereotyping comes into play. And another one which is incredibly uh, important and which we see all the time now in our society around politics is, um, is confirmational bias. And that is that we tend to gather information to support an already point of view. And you can, you can see this easily if you watch the news and see how the same news story is covered. If we watch the way COVID is studied right now, you know, you've got one group of news reporters who seem to be out to really get the science out to people or whatever scientific study comes out. And you've got another group of reporters who seem to be defensive about it and are trying to protect the president's point of view. And, and, you know, and, and no matter what information goes into that cycle, people will cherry pick the information that supports their point of view. And, and I think this is one of the things that, that um, the research shows us that's the most fascinating, Bill, is that is that we live in the illusion um, that as human beings we're rational. This is one of the great illusions of humanity. It goes all the way back to Plato 2,500 years ago, who said that you know, the, the, the right people were the, one, the charioteers who held the raging emotions representing the horses in place. You probably remember that from Phaedrus Dialogues when you were in Philosophy 101 in college. You know? um, but the truth is um, that we're less rational and more rationalizing as human beings that we actually make most of our decisions from our emotional reactions, and then we gather the information that supports those points of view. So, so confirmation bias is, is a particularly uh, in, impactful one. I mean, some scientists have, have identified something like 157 different distinct biases, so there, 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 there are all kinds of different nuances of this. But there are other ones that are particularly there. Another one is commitment. Um, bias. And that is that once we've committed to something, we will gather, we will try to do everything we can to support that point of view. And, and that plays out in what's often been called the um, backfire effect. So that, and we see this right now in, in politics, that if you have a strong point of view and the more indefensible that point of view becomes, the harder it is to defend that point of view, the more you confront information, um, the more dug in you get. 
because it's it, because at some point it's not about rationality anymore. It's just about defending the fort, and 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 this can play out in personal relationships as well. Howard, at this point in the show, I'd just like to remind our audience that you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Oran. Today, we're speaking with Howard Ross. He's the author of Everyday Bias. Howard, can you tell us where we can get the book and a website? Because I'm sure people want to know more about this. Sure. The, the book's available, in, in, and actually, it's coming out now in second edition, but it's available for pre-order on any of the major booksellers. And my website is howardjross.com or udarta, U-D-A-R-T-A dot com. We'll give that information again if someone wants to get it down, but I will tell people not only is it an informative read and you'll understand more about sports radio arguments and politics and anything that you see on TV, but the next cocktail party you go to, if you read Howard's book, you will be the most fascinating person. I'm going to be so brilliant when I go to a party, if I'm invited to a party, that I know all these little tips that Howard's telling me. I think I'm going to write them on the inside of my hand like a cheat sheet for an exam in college or something. Howard, do we tend to see the world in groups like, I'm going to use the Met fan, Yankee fan. I'm a Met fan. Everything has to be about the Mets being better, their colors, their stadium, and the Yankee fans see it that way. Do we need to identify ourselves by a group? Is that part of it? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I wrote another book that, that came out in 2018 called Our Search for Belonging, which was specifically about that bill. And um, and that is that what we've realized is that, um, you know, most people are familiar, I think, or a lot of people would be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. Abraham Maslow created that model in 1943, and it's been a basic foundation of psychology for 75 years. And that is that, you know, you have certain needs before you have other needs met. In Maslow's model, the primary need is physiological, food, sleep, et cetera and then safety, then belonging, then then self-esteem, and then finally self-actualization. In fact, we're finding out now that Maslow was probably wrong, that belonging is our key human need, that, that the need to fit in with whatever we define as our tribe, um, to be part of a group, is a fundamental survival mechanism for human beings. Because if you think about it, you know, the most vulnerable time of a human's existence is, is infancy, and, and we have to be taken care of longer than any other animal on the planet. So the first impression we get as children is, I exist because you exist. And, and for most of human history, if you weren't accepted by your tribe, if you were ostracized by your tribe, you have very sl- slim chances of survival. So it's kind of embedded in us to fit in with the tribes that we're a part of. And we see that now in the kind of polarization that's happening um, in society. It's no longer uh, where politics is concerned, for example. We no longer differ on issues. It's no longer I agree with you about civil rights, but disagree with you about gun rights, but agree with you about foreign policy. It's now become you're one of them and I'm one of us. And um, and so if you voted for Trump and I voted for Clinton, you know, we're in different tribes completely. And, and when, when it gets personal like that, when it gets identity based like that, it's much easier to completely discount that other person. I, would, I think I, I read an anecdote in your book how even the weather, we can be biased toward the weather. I think it was in a medical school or yes. someone. Can you tell us that one? Yes. That was oh, one of my favorites. Right. That was a study that was done by Don Rettelmeyer, who's a, a, just a brilliant guy at the University of Toronto. What they did was they looked at medical school interviews. Um, and uh, which over, I think it was a seven year period. Um, I don't have the data right in front of me, but I think it was about a seven year period. And, you know, for most people know medical school interviews are among the most competitive interviews anybody can engage in because pretty much everybody who applies to medical school is smart and they're already capable and competent or they wouldn't waste their time. And what they did is they tracked the interviews against the weather reports on, on the particular days that the interviews happened over a course of years. And they found that on people who were interviewed on rainy days, on a rainy or snowy, I think it was rainy or snowy days, but I think it emphasized mostly rainy days, um, received uh, uh, evaluations that were roughly equivalent to if they'd gotten 10% lower scores under MedCats. In other words, the fact that, that you know, it was a rainy day affected the interviewer's classification of the candidate and and at first you say that's kind of crazy but then you think about it you know you, you come to, to come to work on a beautiful day it's sunny it's a lovely spring day you walk in and good morning everybody what a beautiful day let's sit down and do this interview and you're in a good mood and and so you're open and then you come in on one of those days when it's you know traffic was terrible you, you're you're wet up to your ankles with the sloppiness from that you got your raincoat and you're all right let's get this interview done you know, and, and so mood impacts interview and, of course, environment impacts mood. And isn't that interesting? You work so hard to get into Harvard, Stanford, Hofstra Medical School, what, whatever school you, you're aiming for. And the weather, which you have no control over and it's just happenstance, it might be a cloudy morning and a clear afternoon, is basically 
taking up a big part of this decision equivalent to 10% of your exam points. Yeah, and, and this happen, This happens in, in literally thousands of ways. I mean, you're in a bad mood because you had a fight with your spouse that morning. Or um, or you do one interview in the morning, first thing when you're fresh at your desk, and another interview on Skype at 6 o'clock in the evening when you've got a you know, faulty connection. You know, I mean, there, there are just hundreds and hundreds of things that can affect the quality that we don't attribute. Now, now this stuff is going to happen. You can't prevent it from happening. But the more we're aware of it, the more we can include, include it in the equation, the more likely we are to make more conscious and, and better decisions. I guess this is why they always say the outcome of a legal case may depend on what the judge had for breakfast or if his burrito was good or not so good. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Or, or, or who the particular um, who, who the particular uh, defendant reminds them of um, and whether or not they've had a personal experience with similar kinds of things in their life. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, let's say you got a judge who's who's you know, was in a divorce, an ugly divorce. And, you know, a woman comes in and accused of something and he founds, and he finds out in the, you know, during a testimony that she dumped her husband, um, you know, that that becomes a factor in how he sees that woman and how much he trusts her, how much he evaluates, how he evaluates her, how much credibility he gives to her, how much compassion he feels for her, all of those kinds of things. And the opposite could be true as well. You know, somebody comes in who was dumped by his wife, like, like, the judge was and all of a sudden he feels a little bit of you know empathy for them because he can put himself easily in, in their story better do our research on judges and forget the law and find out who's the judge is yeah, for that day that's right now, did i read in your book howard that intelligent people with high self-esteem which would be a lot of them because they're leaders etc may be the most likely ones to develop blind spots yeah, there's some there's some research that indicates that, and, and and again, if you think about it, there's some logic to it. I mean, most of us uh, walk around with some sense of self doubt, and um, we question ourselves at times, and we're open to the fact that we might make mistakes. But if you're if you're somebody who's been considered the brightest bulb in the box, you know, the smartest person in the room for your whole life, at some point, um, that that um, becomes a form of power, and uh, we begin to stop even checking ourselves. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, excessive malignant narcissism, and, as we see demonstrated right in front of us these days. Um, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who are generally just, they're so smart that, that at some point, they just assume that any thought that they have is true or accurate, and they're very good at self-justifying as well. So, so we have to be really careful not to think that we can sort of think ourselves out of this just because we're smart people. And Howard, you really did your work on this book because I read one section and, and this I get, what certainly astounded me. These concepts and principles actually start with babies. They can watch a, a baby's eyes, how they identify with a parent or a person taking care of them. And I think you gave a few experiments there and that were done not by you, by other people. Yes. But how as early as like three to six months, babies are even developing these principles. Yeah, we notice that this is true, especially around race, um, that, that babies tend to seem to associate more um, easily. And, and again, as you said, eye contact is one of the ways they judge us with, with infants, um, with people who are of the same race as their parents, which, you know, usually means, you know, their own race at, at that point. Now, now it'd be interesting to see, and I haven't seen any research yet about how this plays out with, um, with mixed race parents. I am particularly interested because four of my six grandchildren are mixed race. So, you know, I'm kind of curious to see how that would play out over time. Uh, but it, but it, again, this makes perfect sense. The person who my entire life is dependent upon looks like this. Therefore, I'm going to look to other people who look like this in order to, to feel safe. And, and so there's, you know, there, there's a fundamental logic to the illogic of this. <laughs> No, it, it was fascinating, and I think even that the child would look to a parent, and if the parent smiled, they smiled in one example, I think, or, or they reacted the same as the parent or the caregiver who was closest to them, uh, which obviously you would think at three months, they're just babies, and yet they're picking up these signs of the world, which is probably good because it keeps them from getting hurt or doing something that might endanger their life. Yeah, and, and Bill, I think one of the things that's important for people to realize is that, that these patterns also frame how we see events that happen in front of us and can condition how we perceive them. So if you look at the George Floyd murder, for example, um, you know, we know this was a terrible incident and, and you know, before that it was Breonna Taylor and before that Tamir Rice and before that Sandra Bland that we go back to all this list of, you know, this terror terrible list of names of people who died at the hands of police officers. And, and how we see that is conditioned by who we are. So, for example, my experience is that white people, and I'm talking about white people who are concerned about this, tend to see this as a series of 
bad incidents that happen, you know, horrible incidents that happen. And we need to stop these incidents from happening. And you hear people say, when are these incidents going to stop? But of course, for most African Americans, they don't live as incidents. They live as a continuous flow of everyday experience that, that every now and again pops up to the surface for everybody else to see. Because for, for most African Americans I know, for example, who have teenage children, they worry every time the, children, the child goes out the house that they're going to make it home safely. And it has nothing to do necessarily with their station in life. I had a client here in D.C. who, um, African-American man, make over half a million dollars a year living in a very expensive, mostly white uh, suburban community. And he told me in tears in a private conversation that his son, who was an Ivy League student, was home one summer from college. And during 10 weeks of being home that summer, was stopped four times by police officers coming in and out of his own neighborhood driving his father's car. He was never charged with a crime. His only crime was being a young black man driving an expensive car in a white neighborhood. But this is a guy, the father I'm talking about, who's made it. His son is in Ivy League school. He's making a half million dollars a year. He's working at a big corporation everybody would know. And yet he still deals with this on a day-to-day basis based on these kinds of biases and assumptions. So, So it's important for us to understand that that a lot of the feelings that are out there, for example, in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, come from a lifetime of these kinds of daily experiences of living while black um, that most white people really don't see, don't experience, and have no idea in some cases are even going on, and certainly have no idea how often they're going on and how regularly they occur. All right, once again, I want our audience to know if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm Bill Horan, your host. Our guest today is Howard Ross. He is the author of Everyday Bias. Howard, once again, I'm going to ask you to tell us get the website where we can find out more information about this very, very interesting subject and where we can get the book so we can be as smart as you. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I, I, won't, I won't take on the last one. But um, um, yeah, it can be, like I said, the book is available at any major um, you know, book dealer, on Amazon or any of those kinds of places. Um, the website, howardjross.com or udarta, U-D-A-R-T-A.com. Now, uh, as I was going through your book, you have a list, I think it's of, of 10 different biases. And I found many of them fascinating and things that I think we fall into virtually every day. So I'm going to ask you about some of them and maybe you can go in depth. One was diagnosis bias. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, You know, we look at a situation and we, um, and we try to determine what's going on with the situation in front of us. Um, And so we diagnose the situation, but of course we can only diagnose that situation based on the degree to which we understand what we see. So if, for example, um, you see something that's reminiscent, I mean, the example I gave with the judge earlier, you know, if you see a situation where, um, where there's a, a marital strife between, you know, let's say a man and a woman in a particular case, and you had marital strife yourself with your husband or wife or partner, whatever it is, that what happens in your relate happened in your relationship is likely likely to be projected on your interpretation, the way you diagnose the relationship in front of you. So if you're, let's say in my case, if my wife had treated me unfairly in some way in my relationship, and then I hear there's some question as to who's treating who fairly in this relationship, it's not a big leap for me to assume it's the woman who's treating the the husband unfairly. Um, and, And so we tend to diagnose based on that prior experience. Now, in some cases, as we said before, my son, my oldest son is a doctor, <clears throat> excuse me, he's an electrophysiologist as a heart surgeon. That kind of diagnosis bias can be really helpful um, because it helps him in that case because it's informed. And this is what Malcolm Gladwell talked about in his book, Blink, that, that you make informed assumptions. He's seen enough people with enough circumstances that are similar that he can very quickly find what's going on and may in fact be able to be life-saving in that case because he very quickly becomes comes to the determination of what's needed. Um, but sometimes it can be erroneous as well. I'm just thinking probably the most interesting evening a person could have, I'm, as I'm talking to you now, if you and Malcolm Gladwell were on stage together talking about your books, honestly, I, I think we would all come out like uh, the two of you would be worth 10 TED Talks right there or some multiple of them because of the interest. And, and these are everyday things that we come up with. And literally, as our audience walks away from the show and gets in their car or goes back to work or in the kitchen, they're going to be exhibiting some type of bias that you reference in your book. What is loss aversion bias? Well, the loss aversion bias is, is somewhat um, related to the commitment bias that I talked about earlier. And that is that when we've really, when we really invested in something, um, sometimes we irrationally um, can't let go of it. The classic example like this, Bill, if you've ever played poker, 
you know, you've got, you've got a hand you think is a good hand. You've, you've, you know, you've bet a lot on, on the hand. Um, and at some point you realize, I don't think I could beat this guy, but you invested so much in the hand that you just can't help but play it out. Even though you know you're losing more money by seeing him on that last bet, you know, you're going to lose more money. You know that your chances of winning are very, very slim. And yet you can't not do it just because you've put in enough so far that you've got to, you got to stick with it. And, and we do that with relationships. Um, you know, people stay in bad marriages for way longer than they, than they should um, because they know that they're not healthy. But, you know, I've put in my 20 years, damn it, I'm going to see it to the end. Um, and uh, we see it in jobs, people who don't leave jobs because they've invested a lot in them. Um, so it shows up in a lot of different places. And there's another concept called priming. What is that? Well, priming is an interesting, in behavioral economics, it's often called nudging. Um, so, um, you know, and, and priming is actually a little bit what we saw in the thing you, you, we were talking about earlier about the wine. I mean, what basically the music and the flag primes one to think about France. And so French wines all of a sudden become more appealing to me. And there, there are lots of great examples of priming techniques. Uh, one of the best ones um, is... Um, in looking at organ donation, you know, so for example, there are people who studied organ donation around the world and, and a lot of most Western countries at this point do the same kind of thing that we do here in the States where you can sign something on your driver's license that says you'll leave your organs to be harvested after you die to be used for, um, for transplants, right? So, um, and what they found was that about you know, half the countries had like 90% participation. And then there were a handful of countries, so maybe a little bit more than half, and a handful of the countries in Europe had very, very low participation. So at first they thought, well, you know, why are some countries so much more altruistic than other countries? And then they realized um, that it wasn't that at all, that, that the question wasn't how, that the result was determined by how the question was asked. So in other words, in countries where they said, unless you check this box, you, we're going to assume you're okay with leaving your organs for other people, it was very, very high. And in places where they said, please check this box, if you're willing to leave your organs for other people, it was very low. So the question wasn't altruism about leaving organs. The question was whether you ask people to check a box or not. That, that, that the presumptive um, uh, thing that, that, you know, that if you don't check it, it'll go in was a priming technique to prime people in order to do that. Now, colors prime people. Um, we know that there's a, there's a, a a whole bunch of studies around a particular shade of the color pink that calms people down. And they found that by painting prison walls, you can actually calm people down by painting prison walls, that color. Um, there are sounds that prime us. And there are even things that we have in our memory, like Winston tastes good. Like, you know, most people know like a cigarette. Should. <laughs> I read even that in your book, <laughs> even though that commercial hasn't been on the air for 30 years. And a lot of people haven't even heard it. We, we hear certain things like that. So in behavioral economics, this has led to, Richard Thayer created this whole um, orientation called nudging, like certain things we can do to orient people in particular ways by reminding them of certain things. Howard, I could talk to you for hours, but our producer would get me in trouble and cut me off. I found this very, very interesting. I want to remind our audience, the book is Everyday Bias, a really enjoyable read. It's not something it's so technical you can't enjoy it, and you will be the most fascinating person in the next time you're with your group or your friends. Our guest is Howard Ross. He's the author. Howard, once again, just give us that way website? Sure, Bill. It's, it's howardjross.com or udarta, U-D-A-R-T-A dot com. You've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success. 